Today I'm going to be looking at the new movie, The Crippled Fukushima Daiichi Plan. A space survival thriller so immersive and visually stunning, it has driven everyone who's watched it violently mad, including myself. More radioactive water has been found leaking at the crippled Fukushima Daiichi plant. Tokyo Electric Power Company officials say they failed to correctly estimate how much water a line of tanks on a slope could hold. I have totally lost my mind and, even now, am completely disconnected from reality. We have to confess that another leak has happened. We are very sorry for this. About 430 liters of highly radioactive wastewater leaked from the top of a tank on Wednesday. The water was measured as having 200,000 becquerels of beta-ray-emitting radioactive materials per liter. The government limit for releasing such water into the ocean is 30 becquerels per liter. TEPCO officials say the water likely drained into the sea about 200 meters away. The tank is situated on a slope and is tilted. Usually, this angle is taken into consideration when calculating how much water it can hold. But TEPCO officials say too much water was added this time and the wastewater overflowed. The tank is the lowest of a bank of five along a slope connected with pipes. The water level is higher in those closer to the ocean, but only the one at the highest position was equipped with a water gauge. Workers believe that if they kept the water level in the tank at 98 percent, or 50 centimeters from the top, no water would spill, even from the lowest tank. But they miscalculated. TAPCO faces an increasing workload as the firm must not only build more tanks, but also cope with an increase in contaminated rain and groundwater, as well as chronic leaks. At one point in the movie, I imagine myself choking my neighbor's dog to death. Folks, I am currently a threat to myself and to those around me. I should be locked up in a mental institution and cared for by top mental health professionals. People in Fukushima still have doubts. Government leaders there have decided to do their own test on ocean water near the plant. Officials held an emergency meeting to discuss the problem. They decided to launch an inspection as early as Thursday. They'll test water near a drain that they think may be carrying radioactive water. TEPCO's president recently vowed to make containing wastewater his highest priority. But Fukushima governor, Fukushima's governor, Yuhei Sato, said he's skeptical. And he criticized TEPCO's handling of the leaks. Fukushima officials say they are summoning TEPCO. They are demanding the utility quickly act to keep more contaminated water from seeping from the plant. Now, the operator of two nuclear plants in central Japan may have to wait a little longer before it can fire up some of its idled reactors. Nuclear regulators have asked for additional surveys to make sure the facilities can withstand earthquakes because they sit near active faults. Officials with Kansai Electric Power Company want to resume operations at the Oi and Takahama nuclear plants. They met with members of the Nuclear Regulation Authority to talk about the three active faults that run near the facilities, and they repeated their claim that the faults would not shift simultaneously. They came to that conclusion after analyzing sonar surveys of regional topography, but experts who were asked to attend the meeting said the interpretation is only convenient for the utility. A senior member of the regulator said there is no definitive proof that the faults will not shift at the same time. Kunihiko Shimazaki instructed Kansai Electric to conduct additional surveys. Speaking with Arnie Gunderson, who's with Fairwinds Energy Education, radioactivity is already leaking into the Pacific and has been for quite some time, and there's indicators that it has gotten as far as the West Coast. Is that so, of, of the United States? Um, yeah, well, actually, it's five months after the accident. Uh, uh, tuna showed up on the West Coast that were uh, contaminated from Fukushima, and what they did was they ingested the cesium near near Japan and then just swam for uh, five months over to the uh, west coast of the U.S. and still had contamination in them. But now we're seeing the ocean itself contaminated. We're seeing a, a plume or a wedge of radiation. It's about, oh, I don't know, nine months away from the Pacific uh, coast. Um, you know, and it contains 
about 10 times more cesium than what was in the ocean during the old bomb days, during bomb testing days. So it's a, the measurable slug of cesium now is uh, contaminating the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, the Pacific Ocean is a big place, and uh, to think about it, we've contaminated the Pacific Ocean. Wow. Uh, Arnie, I want to ask you a question in this context. What's possibly going to happen in the future with this situation and what's probably going to happen? The possible and the probable. I guess it's the worst case scenario and maybe, or put another way, the worst case and the best case scenario. What's the worst case scenario we can expect? And then let's talk about the best. Well, the best, the, the worst case is if Tokyo Electric continues to do um, what they're doing. They're not an engineering company. They're an operating company. And uh, so we've got the wrong skill set uh, on this site. We really need to replace Tokyo Electric. But the, um, uh, my fear is a uh, is an aftershock. The, um, the after the Sumatra earthquake back uh, in '04, that was a nine, and, and about two or three years afterward, there was a Richter eight six. Mm. Um, this was a nine three, and we haven't had the aftershock yet. None of these buildings, uh, you know, that had the explosions. Uh, none of these reactor containments, uh, nor the tank farm, can withstand it. So the to my mind, the worst case is a, uh, is a seismic event. And I've been saying, I don't care what God you pray to, but let's pray that there's no earthquake. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, uh, um, that's key number one. Um, the, the other thing is Tokyo Electric is responsible now to try to empty the fuel pool at um, Fukushima Unit 4, which is the most dangerous one. It has the most fuel in the fuel pool. And that's the one that has no roof over the nuclear fuel. The, um, the problem there is that the um, um, fuel pool has been distorted, almost like a pack of cigarettes getting crushed. So it's really hard to pull a cigarette out of a cigarette pack when, when the pack is crushed. Well, this nuclear fuel is in a fuel pool, and if they pull too hard, uh, they likely will snap a bundle, and, and that will release radioactive material into the building. And Tokyo Electric has already said that they're just going to pump that right out and, uh, into the air. So. We're not done with radioactive releases. So that's, that's the worst case. Best case is uh, we get rid of Tokyo Electric, replace them with a, uh, a firm that knows what they're doing. Hmm. And, and there are six or seven in the world who can do this job, unfortunately. Um, the, the other piece of it, though, is money. It always boils down to money. That Japan has to admit to its own people that they're on the hook here for half a trillion dollars, U.S. dollars. Wow. And right now, the Abe regime doesn't want that to happen because if people realize the cost, they're going to say, well, we don't want any more nuclear plants starting back up. Um, and the last piece is citizen oversight. We're, we're uh, constantly frustrated. We have scientists contacting us, doctors contacting us, telling us that their patients are suffering from radiation-induced injuries or you know, they're noticing deformities in, in animals and plants. Um, but yet the Japanese government is um, trying to put the heat on them to prevent those studies from moving forward. So uh, with citizen oversight, we've got to go around this government infrastructure. Um, so a new contractor with some citizen oversight and the admission that this is a really costly problem, um, I think they can move forward. But if they don't do those three things, we're going to be mired in this mess for, for years. What then is the is the best we can expect in these circumstances, Arnie Gunderson, talking about Fukushima? Well, the, at least for another two years, the plant is going to be uh, leaking into the Pacific. So it, there's nothing they can do to prevent the groundwater from moving into the Pacific for at least another two years. Uh, two years out, the ice wall may work, it may not. So we're going to see not just the contamination that, that's there, but new contamination leaking into the Pacific. That, that's the, the, the best case, if, if that's all that happens. And of course, mm -hmm. uh, we all have to pray that there's no earthquake, because the, the, at least two of the structures, Fukushima 4 and Fukushima 3, are really compromised when it comes to uh, a potential for earthquake damage. In the, uh, I think it's the E News, uh, E News, the website. They talk the, talk about 100 babies with polydactyl uh, situation. They have six fingers. This kind of exotic, strange, 
you know, Night of the Living Dead kind of things happening there. There's an X-ray picture, I think, on their website of, of a hand with six digits. Have you heard about that? Uh, yes, and e and &E News is a great source. Um, I, I check it a couple times a day. Um, you know, we've, um, we've seen that, and we've also seen the thyroid cancers. The deformities, the stillbirths, and the increased morbidity is not being reported by the Japanese. They used to publish a report every year that had a prefecture by prefecture breakdown. A prefecture is like a state, and Fukushima prefecture is about as big as Connecticut. So the, the prefecture by prefecture breakdown of, um, of deformities and stillbirths and things like that, well, they stopped publishing that report. Uh, they did say that in 2011 there was an increase in um, stillbirths and, and um, deformities, but they're not providing scientists with the prefecture by prefecture breakdown. You know that's bad news for science, and uh, um, uh, you know, clearly, um, you know they would rather have the Olympics and be honest with their own people about the, the health effects they're, they're facing. Now, just excuse my ignorance, but the Olympics—they're coming up in, in in Tokyo again soon. Is that what's going on? Well, the Abe administration just won the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo. Yes. You know, so it's it's seven years out, um, and we've had people say, you know, uh, I'm a runner, should I go? And my reaction is, think about the people that are living there for the next seven years. You know, you're going to be there for two weeks, and these people are there for seven years. Um, so in a, um, in a public relations um, stunt, they really wanted to take people's minds off of uh, the condition of the reactors. Yes. Um, the Prime Minister Abe said to the uh, Japanese that there's no problems at Fukushima, and it was just a you know a, a bold-faced lie. Uh, he needed to get the Olympics, and he succeeded in getting the Olympics. But now he's got a half a trillion dollar problem up at Daiichi, and he wants to um, take everybody's mind off it by having them watch runners through the streets of Tokyo. I suppose. Uh, I mean, without. You're creating stereotypes as a, a degree of safe face saving going on here. We know that the Japanese are very conscious of that, and uh, they probably find it difficult to admit the mistakes. Is that part of it? Yes, I saw that. You know, I was over there twice since the accident, and um, um, there are very conscientious scientists, and especially women, who have said, "Forget face saving. Let's you know, it's about the next generation." But uh, men and especially men in government are are driving this train, and they really do want to ignore the uh, the health consequences that um, that are occurring up there. Popular fast food chain Yoshinoya to grow food 60 miles from Fukushima. A Japanese fast food chain has announced plans to grow rice and vegetables on a farm 60 miles from the crippled Fukushima power plant, site of the world's worst nuclear disaster since Chernobyl in 86. Yoshinoya Holdings, which sells gyodon, a stewed beef over rice, has formed a joint venture with local farmers to grow onions, cabbage, and rice for use in outlets across the country. About 160,000 people nearest the plant were ordered to move out, and the government established a 12-mile compulsory evacuation zone after the earthquake and tsunami in March 2011 caused reactor meltdowns and contaminated water, vegetables, and air. The crops will be grown in Shirakawa the, to the southwest of the plant. The company said, Yoshinoya said, it would ensure that the vegetables were safe. They said in a statement, quote, we will employ local people in the factory. We think this will lead to support for reconstruction. James, this seems too strange for words. Uh, strange isn't the word that I would use, but uh, but uh, gyudon, James, gyudon. Uh, yes, this is basically the Japanese McDonald's. It's beef on rice. It's a kind of standard Japanese fast food thing here. This is the kind of the the biggest uh, such chain that that's all across uh, Japan. So it's a place that I've been to before. I eat there maybe once a year. Um, but never again, anyway. Um, I think there's a good and a bad thing from this story that we can take away. The good is that at least they've announced this openly so that we know about it and consumers can make an informed decision never to eat there again. 
Um, but I think the bad news might be that if other uh, companies see this, of course, they will never actually make a big press release out of it. And hey, we're getting our food from Fukushima. I think the uh, the takeaway from this for the, uh, the the other fast food restaurants and other restaurant chains will be, hey, you can source cheap food from Fukushima, just don't tell anybody about it. That's what I worry about. That's, I think, the major concern. Um, another important story and a positive story that's just broken that I've uh, put up on FukushimaUpdate.com, the ex-Japanese Prime Minister Junichiro Koizumi, who is a very popular Prime Minister in his time, enjoyed over 80% approval ratings, but was staunchly pro-nuclear and part of the kind of conservative uh, conservative, conservative Japanese wing, because I think they're, they're both pretty conservative. But, uh, but he was staunchly pro-nuclear during his tenure as prime minister in the middle part of last decade, and he just came out in a speech in Nagoya the other day saying that he wants uh, Japan to adopt a zero nuclear policy. And he still has a, a, quite a bit of political weight and uh, gravitas behind him, so that might signal a shift in the political tide here. Who knows? I'm not sure Shinzo Abe is going to turn around on a dime like that and, and uh, take back his uh, pro-nuclear stance. But at any rate, it is a hopeful sign. And I think this is the most high-profile figure we've seen um, make a 180 on, on the issue so far. So it is a sign that uh, anti-nuclear sentiment really is growing here. And it's really, again, just a question of uh, whether the people are going to press forward on this and, and really get rid of the, uh, the nuclear cancer from this uh, island. Meanwhile, here on the west coast of America, I think as the headlines show we're bracing ourselves for another powerful wave of radiation to hit here on the west coast. So again, this, this Fukushima story, James, we've now essentially been talking about for two and a half years, and we've covered it, I think, from many, many different angles, and it's, and it's probably the sort of one story that we've returned to time and time again, because... I, I think it helps it helps shine a light on you know, on a lot of different areas uh, unfortunately for for as bad as that is I think we can kind of learn things from it hopefully